So have y'all heard of the Fishla First Breakthrough Initiative? Okay, so um, <clears throat> that's ended now, but um, in 2005, um, because of so many uh, catheter-related infections um, and cost of Medicare to pay for these patients, um, CMS and the End Stage Renal Disease Network created a Fishla First Breakthrough Initiative. So the goal was to obtain 66% of AV fishlas in use in the HD population. And so as you can see throughout the years, there's been an increase. Um, and now it's um, called the Fishla First Catheter Last. Um, so this is a Fishla First Workgroup Coalition and CMS combined. The new goals, um, this started in 2013, I think is 68% um, of patients in HD centers have fistulas and less than 10% uh, long-term catheters in patients greater than 90 days. Um, the SVS guidelines, again, um, you know, as we all, we, you know, we, everybody wants a fistula first, but SVS ag agrees to that, but more focus on a functional access, right? Because, I mean, some patients just can't have fistulas, and you shouldn't be trying to create a fistula in someone who has very small veins or has um, other issues why you couldn't just to get a fistula in that patient because that just prolongs their catheter use when that fistula doesn't mature. So the focus is on a functional access, not just an autogenous access. Um, so uh, briefly, you know, what um, is... Um, beneficial, uh, what, you know, what characteristics are favoring um, a fistula versus a graft. So, you know, if they're young, um, you'd like them to have a fistula. Veins are usually the traditional answer is greater than three millimeters. Arteries should be greater than two millimeters. Um, if they've had multiple infections, you'd rather use their own vein or if they're immunocompromised with HIV or had, um, had some sort of transplant. Again, if they're hypocoagulable, um, and then prosthetic, if they're uh, very obese. I mean, some of these patients' arms are the size of, like, your thigh. So that's a little difficult to get a fistula in. Um, and then also... If you if it's an elderly patient and you think that they're you know they're already on HD, maybe just putting a graft in them at this point instead of waiting two months to get a fistula mature might be better. Um, okay, so workup of a patient that you see in clinic. Again, ask them about their dominant hand. Try to go in their non-dominant hand. Any previous or catheters, uh, previous catheters or accesses. So that kind of lets you know. Well, do they have a central venous stenosis or not? Um, at baseline neuropathy of the hands and fingers. That's very important to ask, just because of steel syndrome later. Um, and then blood pressure differential. So blood pressure measurements in both arms. Um, if they're less than 20 um, difference, then don't use that arm. And then of course an Allen's test. Imaging, um, get your vein mapping if you trust your uh, vascular lab. Um, I always do, I get vein mapping, but I also do my own vein mapping in the OR. Um, once the block is the regional block is in, uh, also an arterial duplex. Make sure there's no um, major artery uh, stenosis. Um, in certain patients, venograms and arteriograms are indicated, especially if they're complex. Uh, at Methodist, as Dr. Patel knows, we get many referrals where they're pretty much, I mean, covered in old fistulas and grafts. And so I really have to start with every study I can imagine just so I can come up with a plan because most of them will have some sort of central venous stenosis, occlusion, or so many grafts attached to the brachial artery that they have a stenosis. Um, and then um, if you're thinking about doing a, a lower extremity fistula graft, make sure that you examine the feet. So diabetic ulcers, a big no-no. Even if they have palpable pulses, I would not do a, a fistula graft in the leg. And then ABIs. <clears throat> So your options, uh, simple direct fistulas, radiocephalic, brachiocephalic, uh, proximal radio artery fistulas, and then the transposition. So a forearm transposition, not very common. I, has anybody done those? Yeah, they talk about it, but I, I don't really see much done. Um, upper arm transpositions is more common. Basilic, I actually use the brachial, although very tedious in terms of all the branches. It's usually the last vein that they'll have. Um, and, and it actually it is usually pretty nice um, and unaffected by all their previous accesses. Um, and then saphenous or femoral transpositions. Okay, so I'm just going through, that's easy. Some pictures of radiocephalics. 
And then the brachiocephalic. Okay, so um, forearm um, benefits of this include, you know, more superficial local uh, location, and then, you know, because you're transposing, you're ligating all the branches, so there's no, um, st uh, there's no. Uh, competing for outflow uh, but the drawbacks are that they are long incisions and when any really any when any fistula thrombosis it's much more difficult to salvage than um, a graft that thrombosis um, so this is just some pictures of a basilic forearm transposition again and then that tunneler and that's how it comes out Okay, so um, brachiobacillic fistulas. Um, I do mine in two stages. I don't know, Dr. Patel, what do you? So I, I train doing all of the two stage here, but in practice, I've gone to doing one stage. Really? Okay. Yeah, I just, you know, we can argue about it because every, everyone says that for two stage, before you make that big incision, uh, you want to know that the vein is going to mature. Uh, and, you know, I. Maybe just luck so far, but I haven't had one that hasn't matured. So I, and my partner has kind of always done it that way, and they're like, what's the likelihood of it not maturing? So we've always just done them in one stage, and so far it's working out okay. Do you tunnel, or yeah. do you just make a flap? I tunnel it. Okay. So I make a big horseshoe tunnel and try to get as much vein out as possible on the initial one. Uh, the other thing I find it easier is that when you do the initial anastomosis, sometimes you lose the vein. Yeah. And you're committed and you end up with a short fistula. So by doing it in single stage, it you know exactly how it's going to lay beforehand. And, mm -hmm. you know, you, do, you, do you redo the anastomosis or do you just... Um, I don't. Well, and so, you know, Peden. Yeah. Pete, so um, my partner, Peden, who's the fistula king here in Houston, yeah. he redoes the anastomosis. So he does two stages. And then the second stage, he takes the vein off the anastomosis um, tunnels it and then redoes it because he feels like that, um, you know, negates the whole uh, anastomotic stenosis uh, problem. Um, I do two stages and then the second stage I don't disconnect and I basically make a skin flap like you know breast flap up above and then sort of um, superficialize mm -hmm. it. So it's not technically a transposition, but yeah. I, I mean I've done both ways. Um, what? Who has seen, who does it in one stages or their programs? One stage. Yeah, so many ways to do it. Um, so this is um, just some pictures of <clears throat> actually a, a two stage where um, uh, the anastomosis is redone. So disconnects the vein and then tunnel it and then um, redo the anastomosis. Um, I know some, some surgeons will actually try to do their first stage below the antecubital fossa because that, you know, the thought is to save that vein if you redo the anastomosis. Because in somebody with a short arm, you're not gonna, mm -hmm. you're not gonna have much space to uh, use to cannulate. Okay, other arm transpositions. Um, so this is a cephalic vein transposition, morbidly obese woman um, who uh, actually had a very good caliber cephalic vein, um, and because of her body habitus, a uh, long incision was made, and then the cephalic vein was dissected free. And then that's the transposed fistula. A lot of times, too, if a patient's had a previous forearm graft in that thrombosis, because that's been in for a while, you'll notice that most of their upper arm fit, um, veins are nice and dilated um, because just over time those veins have matured. <clears throat> okay, and then this is, again, like I talked about, um, brachial vein transpositions, which I do actually a, a fair number of. Okay, so the rule of sixes traditionally um, in order uh, for, uh, for you to decide that a fistula is mature, so vein diameter has to be six millimeters, vein depth is less than six millimeters, and flow is greater than 600. Um, and so my partner, Dr. Peden, taught me how to do this. So in patients with very large upper arm, oop, what happened? Uh, is there, there it goes. Okay. Uh, patients with large upper arms um, and difficulty cannulating because it's so deep that uh, we do these lipectomies. So it's kind of like plastic surgery in the arm. They're pretty fun. 
Um, so you, you raise flaps and then um, remove all the fat around the fistula and on top. Uh, leave a drain and then close it up and then the arm sort of scars down Only thing with that is then like one arm is skinnier than like the other arm, but How much Very very little very I mean to the dermis and and that's it so it, it's um, and that's like, that's the key, which, you know, again, Dr. Peening came up with this, but it's, you it kind of like doing brush. You got to make sure that your skin flap has enough, um, blood supply, but thin enough. So, but, um, it, it kind of tedious, but the results are pretty good. Um, okay. So arm grafts, forearm loop, upper arm, femoral chest wall hero. And then again, tapered. So, you know, there's tapered four to six four to seven, and then AccuSeals where you can cannulate immediately. And then don't waste access real estate. Again, plan accordingly. Um, so leg transpositions. These are good options for younger, healthier patients or patients that you find um, are hypercoagulable and clot their, their grafts off. They are not good for patients with congestive heart failure, right? Because you're forming a very high flow, uh, iatrogenic AV fistula in the leg, pretty much. Um, patients who have chronic hypotension, pulmonary hypertension, or obviously prefer arterial disease are not good candidates for leg transpositions. Um, so the femoral vein is, is dissected out and then tunneled. Um, and then this is an example. So this lady is 25 uh, and she was uh, out of access, had a transhepatic catheter actually. Um, and then we did a leg fish on her. Again, look at those veins. Another example of a leg fistula. Okay, so for leg grafts, um, I start with the SFA first because, um, again, the morbid obesity that penetrates uh, Texas and Louisiana. I don't know about the northern states, but geez, um, So, you know, in the groin, all sweaty and it's hot here. So I try to tunnel laterally and stay in the SFA just to prevent infections. Um, keeps you out of the sweaty groin and allows for more options in the future. So if that thrombosis, at least you can get a femoral catheter in and uh, start over. So my algorithm starts simple and work your way up and always think about future options. I warn all my patients that these do not last forever, that this is not going to be something, you know, that eventually we will probably have to do um, interventions to keep it open or even get her, get them a new access. Um, everybody has their algorithm, but the, the textbook is the fishless first, then forearm transpositions, grafts, versus upper arm transpositions, and then upper arm, and then go to the legs. Um, the two options that exist that are a bit newer, who has seen a hero or put a hero in? Oh, that's, that's good. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's good. actually, because I, in fellowship, never learned how to do that until now. And then what about a gore hybrid graft? A few, Okay. Um, so the HERO is, is uh, for indicated for patients with um, central venous occlusions or snow seas where it's part catheter and part um, graft. Just FYI for billing purposes, you don't get the full amount for a graft. You get half of a graft and half of a catheter. And that's how Medicare just screws us all the time. Even though this is probably harder to put in than your traditional AB graft. But so you, you, you put your hero catheter in, there's a connection, a connector, it's metal, and then you, I attached an AccuSeal graft to that um, so that they, you, you know, usually this is their only catheter, right? So you're switching out the catheter for the hero, um, the hero um, catheter, and so I let the, the unit stick them right away and then do your traditional AB graft. <coughs> Um, I start them on some sort of antiplatelet or even anticoagulation because these clot off uh, much easier than a regular graft. Mm -hmm. And then that's just a picture of the tunneler. And then you do your anastomosis to the artery. Um, and then this is just a venogram, fistulogram of your 
hero. Very easy to declot. Um, clot just comes right out. And then the Gore Hypergraft is a uh, six millimeter graft that's connected to a Viabon um, that ranges in diameter. And then, so that enables your venous side to pretty much be sutureless. I don't use it often, um, but good um, option for patients who are completely out of veins and have like a very, uh, you know, large arm with a difficult, uh, you know, you be difficult to sew in their axilla. And so you can basically put a wire and then put your um, sheath in there and, and deploy this Viabon in order to do your venous anastomosis. Um, so that's what it looks like. And then... So you can actually get this vibe on pretty deep into their axillary vein.